Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator and today is a very awesome day as I have finally released the first version of my Overkill's 747-800 guide for Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, so today we are going to check it out. If you are interested in acquiring any of my Overkill's tutorial guides for Microsoft Flight Simulator, please consider joining me on Patreon. Patreon subscribers level tier 2 and above have access to all of my guides as well as any future updates and future guides that will be coming down the road. Link to Patreon can be found in the description below. Alright, so as I was saying today, we finally released the Overkill's 747-800 guide for Microsoft Flight Simulator. There is a ton of information in here. Um, it walks through a ILS flight from Gatwick, London over to... Um, JFK in New York. It is extremely detailed just like the others. Now there's still plenty of work to be done um, and obviously this guide will be updated. Um, real quickly to talk about the other guys. The other guides, um, September really was a very hard month for me guys um, and I do apologize for the delay in the in the guides and I, pe I appreciate all of you Patreon subscribers so so much. Um, and I, I'm so grateful for your patience and understanding through everything that's been going on. Um, and uh, I promise, especially now that this guide is done, um, updating the guides is a lot easier than creating them. Creating them is obviously it just requires so much work and so much research and so much, you know, trial and error. And then with all the issues with the simulator and crashes and bugs and things not behaving the way they should, etc., you know, it really takes a lot of time out of um, just trying to get these put together. But today it is finally done. We're going to walk through it. Now we're only going to be using the guide. I am not going to pull up SimBrief. I am not going to pull up um, uh, Navigraph, anything like that. I'm going to demonstrate that everything you need to complete this flight is in the guide itself. So, without further delay, let's get this started. Alright, so stepping into the seat, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make our way down to our weights and balances. Now, today's tutorial will be a bit slower um, because of the, uh, you know, we're going to be going page by page through the guide. So, forgive me if that drags it out just a little bit longer but again I'm trying to demonstrate what what's all included and actually it looks like we are starting with some electrical power so let's start there so the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure our parking brake is set parking brake check uh, yep and then we're going to come up top I'm actually on the wrong page let's go up one there we go and we want to lift that battery cover we're going to turn the batteries on we're going to take our standby power switch it over to auto and then we can bring up our external powers one and two for each bus and close that cover down as well. And unfortunately, closing the cover is not in the guide. <laughs> and then from here, we will turn on our IRS system. This is the uh, inertial reference system. And so we're going to go align on each channel and then move them up to nav. Now, there's ways to accelerate this, but by default, I believe it takes about eight minutes based on where you are in the world. Um, and you can track that right here. So it looks like six minutes. About six minutes time to align left, center, and right channel over here on the navigation display. All right, let's step back up top. Just finish one more thing off up here, and that's just turning on some um, lights here. So we got our nav light here we can turn on, and then you can turn on your wing lights and logo lights if you prefer. Although these are typically used for um, night operations, so you probably won't need them during the day. All right, let's go to the next page here. And next thing we're going to do is walk through the Salties menu on the MCDU. Um, real quick, something that's obviously not in the guide because it's preference, is what I do recommend doing is anytime you're going to be working on the MCDU, at least while you're on the ground, take your speed brake and pull it back. Oh, there we go. And uh, get rid of the yoke because as you saw in the camera views, you know, it can obstruct these two buttons here. And, you know, if you make a mistake, you're going to need those or if we have like a discontinuity. So just a little tip there right off the bat. Unfortunately, this is the only working MCDU in this aircraft right now. The other one is just mirror the main, the primary. All right. So let's jump into the salty menu. And we're going to start with the IRS as we were just discussing. You can select IRS and here you have its current status. You can update the status, and here you can instantly align. So it's IRS aligned, update, and then if we pick our head up, you can see the heading um, director came up, and as well as the alignment status has now been cleared. <clears throat> Let's return to options for a second. 
meet our source, ADIS source, and TAF source. You click on any one of these and you're going to have these same options. And all this is doing is giving you the ability to determine where um, you get this information if you choose to use the MCU to gather it. Okay, uh, Much like the A32NX. Sim brief integration. Um, now we're not going to be using this today. Today, first, you know, crawl before we walk. Um, I'm going to show how to do this without Sim brief um, integration, but it does have that ability. You just type in your user ID and you're ready to go to the races. And then coming over here to units, you can select your uh, unit weights. So right now we're set for pounds. You can change it to kilograms if you choose. Notice the weight over here changed. Now I do recommend um, keeping this at whatever you have Sim brief set to. So if Sim brief sets to pounds, make sure the aircraft is in pounds, kilograms, set it to kilograms, etc. Okay. All right, let's return to options here. And miscellaneous is the last step here, and you can just hide or show the pilot bodies. Um, I prefer to leave them off. Um, honestly, sometimes they're just kind of creepy. When you look over, and they're just sitting there staring at you or something weird. It's like, nah, I'm good. Okay. So, now that we have gone through the Salty's uh, menu options, let's take a look at SimBrief uh, for a second from our guide. So first, I walk you through how to get into SimBrief, or excuse me, once you log into SimBrief, talk about how to go to the new flight page. We walk through how to set it up. Here's where you would change your units. Reserve fuel, you always wanna make sure you have this set to at least 45 minutes for any IFR flight. Now, I will tell you this, and this is something I'm still, we're gonna find out today whether or not I'm gonna to stick to my guns on this. Um, but an update to the guide, and the very least a recommendation I'm going to give you guys right now, is either increase this, you, there's a few, longer times hour hour and a half something like that you know it does go longer than this or take a bit extra fuel i have noticed that we're coming in on pretty low fuel on the last few flights now that we're not coming in empty we we, we still have fuel so i'll leave that up to you guys and, and your preference and and your comfort level but we are we're getting low fuel warnings as we're getting close to new york so i'm just going to keep that in mind you guys will see that um, the other thing that I did that was a typo here, we selected 1-3 right in sim brief. You need to make sure that we change this to 1-3 left if you decide to do your own. Um, and then in the MCDU, uh, you want to make sure that you're doing that as well. Um, and uh, the reason being is that 1-3 right does not have an ILS approach, which, which is what we're going to be doing today. Okay, cost index. Uh, I still get questions about what cost index is. The biggest way to think about A, in flight simulation, you really don't care. Unless you're using something like NeoFly, I guess, um, then um, cost index absolutely cares or matters. And what cost index is, is the cost to fuel burn ratio, right? So um, basically, the higher this number, the more fuel you burn. If you're going to a place that where fuel is very expensive, you could find yourself spending significantly more money where it might be worth it. For example, if you're going, if you're flying to a destination with very expensive fuel, okay, you might keep this very low and, you know, burn less fuel, more, be more economical. However, if you're flying to another location where fuel is much cheaper and you're going to be taking on much more passengers uh, to take to this location, well, then the passengers, the, the money you make from making a faster flight and getting more people on board and back in the air may be more cost beneficial than saving on fuel. I hope that makes sense, but that's basically the principle of how cost index works. It's based on how much money am I spending on fuel and how much money am I making on the flight and how much money am I making on the next flight to follow, you know, which one is more beneficial? Do I want to get the aircraft to point B quickly and get it reloaded back in the air or do I want to slow down a little bit and save the money on the fuel because the next flight isn't quite as profitable, okay? Anyway, hope that makes sense. So for simulation purposes, general use, it really doesn't matter. You could crank that to 100 and, and you know do it as you choose. We will be departing on runway 26 left. We're carrying 115,000, um, almost 116,000. And actually, I also recommend changing this to 116.9. Um, and I'll explain why when we get into the weights and balances of the aircraft. Stepping on down, um, I also do recommend doing a print preview of the PDF um, that is significantly easier um, to read than this particular window here um, or the quick view, um, which apparently I did not display. I thought I did. Oh, wait, that was it right here. Sorry, this is the quick window here, the OFP summary. But I find it better. This is what the PDF looks like. It's much easier to read, much easier to navigate, um, much more comfortable, if you will. All right, so now let's get into weights and balances of the aircraft.
All right, so setting up our fuel. If we bring our guide back over here just for a second, you can see our uh, block fuel is 176,227 uh, pounds of gas. So let's go to our fuel page and let's load her up. Mm, I go the wrong way. I am going the wrong way. Slightly. There it is. 176.9. Um, now, Simbrief called for 176.2. We're putting an extra 700 pounds on. If you want, you can go through and change the tanks one by one. I hate typing in these and trying to use these sliders because it's just the fuel configuration in the simulator has always been one of those things, or the, I should say the weights and balances menu for Microsoft Flight Simulator has always been one of those things that I don't like. So that's totally your call. I don't worry about little variances like that. I really don't. Um, so that is our fuel requirement, and for payload, remember we said we had 115.9, uh, and what we're actually going to be doing is 116.9, I'm going to show you why. So there it is right there, 116.9, so 1,000 pounds more, but if you try to go back, it's all the way down to 113. So again, if you want to mess around with each one of these and make sure the aircraft's balanced, by all means, I just, uh, I choose not to, so... We're going to leave it 36%, and then I do like to pull this, even though we're still technically within the limits. You know, that's the nice thing about simulation. Again, I like to pull it all the way back and, and have a perfectly centered aircraft, because that's how it works in the real world every time, right? Yeah, I know it doesn't, but still. Anyway, so we have a nice center of gravity, 41.5 on the Mac. And we are all set with our weights and balances. So now, the fun part, let's get into the FMS programming. All right, so the first step here is we're going to go to FMC, and we're going to go to position initialization. Now, the ident page is just identifying everything about the aircraft. We have a model 747-800. We have our ARAC data. The ARAC cycle, according to this, expired on September 8th of 2021, um, which actually probably makes sense. And then we have the engine type, and then you see here your operation program. So this is going to be your OS. And I'm not sure what OPC is, honestly. Um, let's see here. Drag and... I don't know what the FF stands for. You know what? I know what drag is. That's the coefficient. Um, and then I don't know... Oh, company data. That's going to be what, what CO is. So I don't really pay much attention to this page. Guilty as charged. All right. Now here's where it gets fun. So position initialization. First thing we need to do is go echo golf kilo kilo. That's where we're at today for London Gatwick. Now, in other simulators, this process is significantly different. So I want to let you guys know, actually, there's quite a few pages that as we're going through this. Please keep in mind that everything you're about to see is based on limitation or current features of this particular aircraft from Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yes, I am very aware that it is not the correct processes in quite a few different areas, but it is what we have the option to do here in the sim. Okay, so anyway. To set our GPS or, or set our IRS position, what we're going to do is copy our GPS string. Simply click on that. You can see it puts it into the scratch pad here. This is the aircraft's current location according to the GPS satellite, and we're going to align it with the IRS position. Okay. All right. So next, we're going to go over to the root page. And again, Echo Golf Kilo Kilo for the origin. That's where we're currently at. And where are we headed? We are headed to Kilo Juliet Foxtrot Kilo for JFK New York. All right, uh, flight number, we are UPS 4432 today. And I believe we are ready to go over to the departures and arrival. All right, now it's gonna always start you with departures. So what we're gonna be doing is following our flight route here and all of this is in the guide. I just don't wanna waste your time by bouncing the screens back and forth. But even screenshots of the sim brief route itself is in the guide. We're going to be using the Novma 1X. Now, there isn't a transition for this because it is already built into the flight plan. So it is actually a part of the SID itself, and there's only one option for an exit transition. So that's why there's nothing here. Uh, runway 26 left is what we're going to be using today. And we're going to hit execute. Once we've hit execute, we're going to switch over to route again. And now we're going to move over to the next page. First thing, vias basically are all your airways, SIDs, and stars. Okay, 
Uh, member airways are nothing more than the best way to think about it is the freeways of the sky. Okay, so you have your freeway number on the left and your uh, exit routes on the right. Okay, so exit ramps if you want to think of them that way. So let's pull up that flight plan. Get down to the right page here. There we go. All right, so we are going to start with Lima 620 as our first airway. Drop it over here on the left. Now, when it does this blank screen thing, just give it a second. It is processing. All right, boom. Discontinuity. That just means that uh, it doesn't know how to connect with this flight plan here because we don't have an associated waypoint. So let's grab that. And we are going to Sierra Alpha Mike as the waypoint. Okay, now you got a whole bunch of them here. What this means is that around the world, there are multiple locations called SAM. So let me show you guys what we're going to do here. We're going to bring this page down here. And what we do is we scroll down to the detailed route. You know what? I will show you this. Let me pull up that flight plan. I actually have it in PDF already. I want to show you guys this. So here's the PDF that this, and there are screenshots of every section you need in the guide, but the entire PDF itself is not there. What you want to do is scroll down to the detailed route. This is our detailed route here. And we're going to find Sam. There it is right here. And what you're looking for is here, the South Southampton uh, coordinates. Okay, these are your longitude and latitude coordinates, and that's what we're looking for. And that's going to be this one right here, the second line. A lot of people like to operate. Well, it's, it's going to be the closest one to you. Don't do that. Verify the coordinates. Okay, or you might find yourself in a part of the world you didn't mean to be on. <clears throat> All right, so got that one in there selected all good to go let's continue on with our flight plan next uh, location is U uniform november 866 drop that in oh what did i type did i type something um hmm oh you, um that was my fault helps when you don't skip one so again, so the reason why I did that is because I tried, there's another one that goes before that. And so me trying to put that one in there, it didn't know how to connect those, those locations. It couldn't do that. So we're going to go M195, Mike195, and we're going to Lorku. And then again, I don't know if I'm saying these right. I don't know what their actual things are. I'd have to go and look at the detailed route. All right, and... Let's see here. Now we want the uniform November 866. Dropping that in. Again, sometimes it takes a second. Boom. And we're going to Gober. And drop that guy in there like so. And the last one is uniform November 484 for this page anyway. And we're heading over to Reggie. Ciao. Okay, so now at this point it gets really easy um, to enter in the next part. Is so we're going to move over to next page, and let me bring the guide up here. Now we're going to enter in these directs. Okay, now direct. You know, with the airways, for those of you who don't understand, with the airways we fly a very specific route. Like I said, it's just like driving on the freeway or actually driving on any of the roads. You can't just go to point. If you want to go to Circle K, you have to follow the streets that take you to Circle K. Okay, flying direct, we're not going to take the streets of Cir Circle K. We're going to point the nose directly at Circle K and fly straight at it. Okay. Now, to do that, in the Boeings are very, very easy. You don't have to type direct. You just simply type the waypoint you're going to and put it on the right hand side and direct will automatically populate so it makes it really easy to do these <clears throat> super is the next one then we're jumping on to another airway November 116 alpha drop that in there and we're going to Tusky interesting should have given me an option for another one but that's all right, as long as it takes the right place. November 116 Alpha, yep, going to Tusky. All right. Sometimes it will pop up with a second option for Tusky. If it does, the correct one is in the guides. It gives you the coordinates. And next, 
Let's see here. We are going direct to Plim. I'm going to drop that one in. All right. And let's hit activate and execute. So we're just about done with the flight plan. The next thing we need to do is set up our star, the standard terminal arrival route. So let's go departures and arrivals again and go over to index. From index, we can select the arrival portion now, KJFK to arrival. And we're going to be selecting the parch 3. We're going to be using the plim transition. And we're going to be coming in on ILS 13 left. And we are using the Covir uh, transition. And the whys and hows and etc. are in the guide, as well as screenshots from the approach plates themselves. So everything about why we picked these is also included in the guide itself. But it just has to do with the way the route lined up. Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're flying our route. From our route, we're going to go to Plim. It's our last one, if you guys remember, on our waypoints. And what that is, that's the transition onto the Parch 3 star. Then from the Parch 3 star, the last waypoint we're going to be traveling down to is Kovir. And Kovir is the transition onto the ILS approach. Okay, is how you read that. All right, let's go ahead and hit Execute. And we are all set there. Now we just need to verify that the waypoints and the flight plan is correct. All right, so to verify our waypoints, what we're going to do is take our nav display controller and turn it down to plan. I like to extend at the display range. We're only at about a quarter mile. We should probably open that up quite a bit here. Take it to about 40 nautical miles, between 20 and 40, depending on you know how big your flight plan is and how far you're traveling. We're going pretty darn far. Now, I know this may be hard for some of you to see, but it's just the best way to do this, so bear with me on this. We're going to go over to the legs button here, the op MCDU menu option, and then we're going to use this step key. This is the LSK is what these are called, by the way, line select keys. So the step LSK, and we're going to step through, and what we're looking for is any discontinuities. We're looking for any really weird waypoints that maybe backtrack us a very long way or just look like they don't belong in the flight plan, something that takes us in the really wrong direction for a minute. Okay. So far everything's looking really nice. There's Tusky. Going to Plim. Uh, PVD. Trait. Parch. CCC Rober All right, sorry about that cut off the sim crashed <laughs> Yay Weird it hasn't done it there before and ironically enough um, as I was re-entering the information of course this time the Tusky waypoint did ask me to choose a location There's two different options um, and again the correct one is listed in the guide so let's Go back through the steps because I can't remember exactly where I lost you guys. Um, but let's go step. So again, we're looking for any route discontinuities, which would be a break in the flight plan. We're looking for waypoints that take us maybe way out of where we want to go. Just things that don't belong. You know, you're looking for things that just don't look right. Um, any vectors because we don't have a way to enter vectors at this time. Um, Vectors are requests uh, typically that will come from ATC. It's uh, exactly what sounds like ATC will give you the vectors to a specific location, like that one right there. So let's zoom in. Oh, wrong way. I'm like, what's going on here? So it's from the JFK waypoint, because you have here is the uh, actual runway. Okay, so here's, well, actually, the runway's right here. There's two, three, or one, three left. Okay, so we've got a runway up there, and so this is JFK Waypoint. But right after it, we have a vector. Okay, now a vector is, as I was just about to say as we saw it, um, oops, wrong button. Um, it is a, basically it's waiting for coordinates. Okay, so at this point you would normally, let's open this up a bit, be vectored onto the approach. So this is when ATC would come on and, you know, UPS 4432, make your heading, you know, I don't know, 270, whatever, you know, and then they would tell you, make your heading, you know, 
one eight zero whatever right they're going to vector you around when they're vectoring you they are guiding you around all right now i don't fly with atc at least not the in-game atc i hate the in-game atc i think it's crap um and i've voiced that many times but uh, kind of tell us tell us how you're feeling mike um so what we're going to do with that vector is we need to delete it we need to get rid of it okay and then we can hit execute and now what we should see is that we're going from JFK down to Kovir. This is our transition point, remember, onto the approach, and we'll come around. All right, so, and there are things you can do. It's really your preference. I mean, it depends on how realistic you want to get with this. Um, I'm flying under the simulation that ATC doesn't exist and that they are actually having us fly the full transition. Very oftentimes in real world, you know, you'll actually have ATC take much of this out. You know, that's where those, again, those with, uh, where those vectors come into play. You know, they'll be like, you know, you may be planning for this entire route, but ATC, if they find a pocket right here, they can stick you in. They're going to have you turn and get in there. You know what I mean? Um, especially at a busy airfield like JFK. Um, so anyway, um, we're going to be flying the entire route today though. So flight plan is complete. We're good to go there. Now we just need to uh, see about um, setting up the rest of the MCDU. Sorry, I had a brain fart. All right. So now we need to talk about configuring the rest of the MCDU. And from here, it goes a lot faster, which is the nice part. So um, the nice thing about the way that the MCDU works on the Boeing is they're much easier to navigate. You have a couple different options. You can go to initial reference, which gives you literally a list of everything that you've been doing, um, or it sort of goes page by page. For example, we've already done position, remember? We can go to root, okay? And then from root, we just can finish We just finish that one. And from this page, we can go now to performance initialization. It's sort of just like a book. You just flip it from left to right. All right, so cruise altitude. We're going to be flying at 380, and again, remember, all of this information is in the guide. tells you where to get it, how to get it, why you're doing it. Cost index, we're setting it for 40 today. And reserves are at 14.4 thousand pounds. Okay, and that's the performance initialization page. Let's move over to the thrust limitation. Thrust limitation is taking an assumed outside air temperature and derating the engines. There's multiple reasons to derate the engines, and derate is exactly what it sounds like. We're taking the engine's maximum performance and reducing it. We're telling the, the flight computer, I do not want you to go above this engine power. Now, one of those things in the real world is obviously wear and tear, okay? It reduces the heat, reduces wear and tear, increases the service life of the engines, um, and obviously saving the company money at that point, sort of similar to cost index, right? Same principle as saving fuel. You know, they're just trying to find ways to save money. Another big one, believe it or not, and I remember years ago when I first heard about this, I was sort of shocked, is sound. Um, and these are sound ordinances. Um, airports, there are certain airports you're not allowed to have your your um, engine volume above a certain point and uh, again that has to do with the surrounding areas my thing is like if you're going to build your house next to an airport what do you think <laughs> you know but that's just me hope i didn't offend anybody but that's just me and, and i grew up literally less than half a mile from an airport so i just want to point that out all right so uh we are going to derate to 10% and you can see it already selects climb one. And so climb one again is going to be a derated profile, takeoff derated profile. So we're reducing its maximum output by 10%. And so that's what we're seeing here. 87.9% engine power is the max the engine is able to use uh, to the N1 power, right? So we're our takeoff power. So the engines will not exceed 87.9% as long as auto throttle is engaged. All right. And then we have, again, our climb profile. And you can change this to be whatever you want. If you want to increase this to uh, 30 degrees, then you're going to reduce this even further, et cetera. So remember, the hotter it is outside, the less effective the engines are. And that goes for any aircraft. Um, the, the hotter it gets, um, the more speed it requires to get the necessary lift to get the aircraft off the ground. Um, out here in Phoenix, it's happened quite a few times. So I'm in Tucson, Arizona. It doesn't get quite as hot in Tucson as it does in Phoenix. But there have been multiple times in Phoenix where Sky Harbor has stopped all air traffic because it was too hot. You know, the, 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 it gets to a point where the heat gets to a point where the lift can no longer be generated before the end of the runway. So they have to stop all air traffic and wait for it to cool down. So let's see, we're going to go to takeoff now. 
And from takeoff, we're gonna set our flaps. You're pretty much always gonna be using flaps 10 if you're on a shorter runway or running a very hairy, hairy? <laughs> running a very heavy load. Um, you may you know, use flaps 15 or flaps 20. Um, but uh, from here, and here's our 20% thrust reduction 2N1 like we were just discussing that was on the previous page. And then we wanna set our uh, V speed. So we're just gonna give those a tap, auto calculates. 172 knots, just like we did with some of the other aircraft, the A320, etc. We are going to be using a uh, plus variant, so we're doing 172 plus 10 knots is what we're going to put in the uh, speed intervention box, which we'll talk about in a minute. And again, that's going to be more company preference than anything. Uh, some of the larger aircraft, even 747s, but like A380s, they'll even use plus um, uh, plus 15 or plus 20, depending on on the scenario. Uh, plus 10 is fine uh, for what we're doing, especially as long as the runway is. And it, all it does is just gives a better climb performance. That's really all it is. You have your gross weight and your takeoff gross weight. Okay, so that's going to be minus fuel burn during taxi and startup, etc. All right, and then we can go to the next page here for a second. There's a couple things I want to show you guys here. You have your engine out acceleration height. If you were to, we we're on takeoff, we lose an engine, okay? What's going to happen is, and let's say we passed V1, so remember, if we talk about that for just a second here, you have your V speeds, for those of you who don't understand what these are, V1, okay, at 138 knots, once this aircraft, when we're on our takeoff roll, once this aircraft exceeds 138 knots, it is no longer safe to stop the aircraft. We will not have enough runway to bring this aircraft to a stop. So when you hear the pilots call out V1, what they're saying is, no matter what happens, engine fire, you know, you run over a Volkswagen, doesn't matter. You have to get the airplane in the air at this point, okay, no matter what. And then you deal with the emergencies as you roll out, okay? And that's why one of the things that you're actually supposed to do is if you guys watch YouTube videos, the second you hear the pilot or co pilot, whomever is not actively flying the aircraft, they'll call out V1. And as soon as they do that, you'll see whoever is actually flying the plane take their hand off the throttle. And that way, if something happens, they don't react instinctively and try to slow the aircraft back down. Okay? Then you have VR. This is our rotation speed, the point at which we start pulling the nose back. And then you have V2. V2 is the speed at which the if the aircraft were to suffer an engine loss, it would continue to climb and accelerate at this point. Okay? This is the speed we want to make sure that we're, that we're reaching. So coming back over to the first page here, the engine out acceleration. If we were to lose an engine at 1,000 feet, what's going to happen is the aircraft is going to uh, point nose down, okay? And I just, I don't mean point to the ground, it's just gonna reduce its climb rate, accelerate, and then, you know, resume its climb. So that will happen at 1,000 feet. That's actually really low. Um, but obviously with an engine out, you need to get your thrust and airspeed up as fast as you can. And the idea is that a 1,000 feet, you shouldn't have any obstacles, you know, preventing you from being able to take off. Um, or continue to climb. Now, in normal situations, we should be able to edit this, but it's just not a feature that's available. Um, let's talk about thrust reduction altitude first, then we'll come back up to acceleration height. Thrust reduction altitude, and again, here's our climb one um, D rate. At 1,500 feet, what's going to happen is, so when we hit tow, when we go for takeoff, okay, the aircraft's gonna go to that 87.9% engine power, whatever it may be. Okay, we're gonna climb up, and then once we reach 1,500 feet, those engines are gonna reduce from the takeoff setting to the climb setting. Okay, so you're at 1,500 feet, you're gonna hear the engines pull back as long as the auto throttle, again, is engaged and has control of the aircraft. All right, and so it's gonna start slowing it down to its climb um, performance. Not climb speed, but the engines are gonna to reduce to climb performance. At 3,000 feet, the aircraft is going to do the same thing that we were doing here. At 3,000 feet, the aircraft is going to slightly pitch nose down, reduce its, its climb angle, accelerate, and then you know, once it gets to climb speed, it will resume its climb up to whatever altitude we have in the box. All right, so I just want to explain how all that works, guys. I know that was a lot, but uh, hopefully you found some value in that. All right, and that also wraps up the MCDU configuration for today. Um, at least for this stage of the flight, I should say. So now we're ready to move on to uh, push back, autopilot panel, and uh, getting ready to start these engines. All right, so always the exciting part, getting the aircraft ready to go. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is turn our flight directors on. Now you would have pilot and co-pilot, but as you can see, they're sort of linked together there. We want to arm the auto throttle. 
We want to put our speed that we were talking about in our speed intervention box. That's this guy here. Keep an eye on this speed here. This is the auto throttle's current target speed. Notice how they line up here. And if this is ever not populated, just give this a left click and it will turn it on and engage speed intervention. So we're going to go for 172 plus 10, 182 knots up in the box. You also want to make sure your VORs left and right on both sides are on. Um, these are not modeled um, as far as linked together. Um, so they are individual switches, but uh, they're on by default. So just double check that and make sure that you are truly good to go. Okay, next thing we want to do is, and again, all of this information, screenshots, etc., are in the guide. Um, but we are going to want to set our final runway heading for takeoff, which is going to be 258 degrees for runway 26 left. We want to set our initial altitude according to our SID, Standard Instrument Departure. We are restricted to 4,000 feet until we reach Novma. So we're going to take our alti altitude target and bring it down to 4,000. Okay, next thing we're going to want to do is move right on over here. And we're going to take a look at the barometer and set our current barometric pressure. Now you can do this one of two different ways. You can either call up ATC or get the ATIS or you can just tap B on your keyboard. You can see it change it to two, nine or nine or one. Also, you can left click here and switch between hectopascals and inches. Um, the next thing while we're up here is we're going to adjust our minimums. Just like with landing, we have minimums. We have actual minimums for takeoff as well. And what we're going to be using is that engine out acceleration. Okay, And uh, it's sort of the same principle when you think about it. So for landing, the minimums are the, the standard for radar altimeter is 200 feet for just about anywhere. And that's why you can see the 200 in there by default. And what that means is that as you are coming to land, by 200 feet, if you do not have visual acquisition of the runway, you're to uh, initiate a uh, go around, okay? Um, and with uh, takeoff, it's the opposite, okay? So now we're gonna talk about that 1,000 feet engine out acceleration that we were talking about earlier. You have to reach that 1,000 feet before you can start to pitch the nose down and accelerate, okay? Otherwise, you run into a situation where you, you know, something very bad could happen at that point, right? I mean, you gotta remember right after takeoff, your aircraft is a giant bomb. So, you know, you just be real, real ca cautious and thinking about that, you know, so that way, um, so we have those minimums that we have to uh, obey by. So the minimums for that are going to be 1,000 feet. And again, I'm, I think this is something that would typically change based on airport and uh, company, um, but uh, that's what we're going for. So we're going for 1,000 feet and we do want to change this from radio. Radio is radar altimeter, okay? And it is the aircraft's physical position from uh, ground to plane. Okay, and uh, according to the documentation that I could find, we actually want to be changing this from radio to barometric pressure. Barometric altitude is the 1,000 feet that we want to be at. Okay, so that should put us about 1,200 feet up in the box here um, if we needed that. But hopefully everything goes well and we won't need that. We shouldn't have any engine outages today. I'm not scheduling any. <laughs> All right, and so now we are just about ready to set up for pushback and... Uh, engine start so let's move on to that section all right so with just like with anything else guys it is as you get more and more fluid with it get more and more comfortable with it you'll start developing your own flows and this be a lot faster okay uh, things like starting the APU and things like that can be happening while you're doing other things I just want to give you guys the understand that we're doing this step by step right now um, because of the tutorial's sake so let's start working on that we want to make sure parking brake is set we're going to come upstairs for a minute here. Once the parking brake is set, we want to make sure our beacon light comes on, letting everyone know the aircraft's getting ready to start. We need to turn our fuel pumps on. Now I want to show you something with the fuel pumps too. So here's our fuel pumps. We're going to turn these guys on. Okay. Now, this part necessarily isn't in the guide, but here is our fuel tanks here. Okay. Green for full, blue for full-ish. Okay, and then obviously amber or uh, blank for empty, all right? And you can see the zero uh, tracking there. And then if you come down to, for example, here, and let's turn those center pumps on, even though they're empty, and you guys will see, you get these messages here on the screen. Now they're actually, you know, I'm wrong. There is, this is in the guide. I didn't think it was. 
I thought I had left it out. My bad. Um, notice the amber light here. That indicates that the fuel pump is on, but there isn't any uh, fuel in the tank. So anytime you see either A, the ECAS warning, or B, the amber light here, um, you want to make sure that you come up and turn the respective pumps off. And oops, you can see now they are once again clear to white and uh, the ECAS display has cleared of any error message. So I just want to show you guys that real quick. So with fuel pumps on, we can also now turn on the APU. So we're just going to go on and then to start, it'll automatically rotate back to the on position. Now the drag here is that we can come down here and from the ECAM display control panel, you can select um, engine or stat, excuse me. And from stat, you can see we have an APU line that should be reading the APU performance. You know, as the APU starts to warm up, it has its own N1 and N2 compressors. As the N1 and N2 compressors, we should see exhaust temperature rising, oil quantity, etc. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's not modeled. So what you're going to be looking for to let you know that the APU is up and running is this right here. It takes about 20, 25 seconds ish, you know, so it's still not bad. Um, but just was letting you guys know that, you know, it hopefully one day this will actually be modeled. And this is also in the guide as well, reminding you of that to at least check it with each new release of the versions. All right, so the APU is now on and running. And at this point, oh, yep, that's where I walked through everything. Cool. So we're going to come up top. And we're now going to bring up our APU generators. And we, with that, we can turn external power off. And normally at this point, as we're beginning to push back and getting ready for engine start, we would be shutting the packs down. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's not modeled, but I do have it in the guide as hopefully this is something that will come up because it's, I think it's a big one and it's kind of fun turning things on and off. I don't know why it just is. All right. So let's go ahead and get the pushback rolling. All right, so just to be clear, there isn't any pushback instruction in the guide. Um, and the reason why I left it out this time is A, the Microsoft Flight Simulator has its own default pushback service, and then there's just so many others. Pushback Express, you have the push toolbar pushback, um, what was that, pushback helper, I mean, there's just so many different utilities you can use for pushback. I didn't want to pick any one, so this is assuming that you guys know how to push back. If not, there's a ton, or you can watch this. So to start our pushback, we're simply going to click on the toolbar pushback and hit start pushback. To ground. This is ground. Stand by. I really like this one, by the way. This one's cool. And what's cool about the toolbar pushback is you can hit the expand window and drag this off screen. For example, if you're you know trying to do like a cinematic event or something like that, I'm going to leave it on the screen so that way you guys can see everything. But Let me turn the in-game volume up for you guys just a little bit. If I remember correctly, I turned it down pretty far. So give me just a second here. Let's go to at least 50. Hopefully that won't be too loud. All right, that should still work. And you can see they're still lifting the aircraft. I think this is so cool the way it simulates this. It's actually picking the nose up. Kind of wondering how high he's going to pick it up, but... It does take a bit. One 
We can also select which direction we want to go, and that would actually be helpful of me to tell them. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. We are cleared for start and push. Parking brake set. Okay, cleared for push start. Please release parking brake. All right. And so you can either click the button up here, or you can just come down, release your parking, parking brake. Brakes are released. Commencing pushback. You can start the engines in sequence. Yeah, we'll start in the sequence. So for engine push or for engine start now, what we're going to do is first start with three and four. We're going to turn the engine bleeds on. This provides bleed pressure from the APUs to spin the N1 compressors. All right. So we turn the bleed on, then engine starters three and four. Select the engine on the ECAM display page. And we're going to be looking for approximately 10 to 12 percent. There's 10 and take the engine run or cutoff switches for three and four to the run position. You can slow the tug down because that was a little ridiculous there. <laughs> like going Mach 4. Now the other thing that is in the guide that unfortunately I did forget, and I don't know why I do this every time, I don't know, I, like I looked right past it, is we didn't set our transponder. It's very early on, um, so you want to make sure that we simulate, we got our transponder code, so we're gonna simulate three, two, I don't know, five, four, it doesn't really matter, and then set the transponder to transponder. And from here, we have turned the aircraft too much. So that was my fault looking down. So I got distracted with the transponder. We can stop the pushback. Pushback completed. Please set your parking brake. Set that parking brake. Parking brake set. Parking brake set. Lowering aircraft. So again, my apologies for the transponder. Ground. It is in the guide. Okay, sir. Clear to disconnect. Pin has been removed. See you at the side. And at about sixty percent. Holding position, waiting for the visual. Thank you. The engines are at idle, and we can repeat the process for engines one and two. So, coming back upstairs, engine bleeds, and you can do, turn all the bleed switches on at once. You know that that's that's neither here nor there. That's up to you guys. Um, and then starter switches for one and two. Looking for ten percent, and one and two to the run position. And while we're waiting there, we can come upstairs, set our anti-ice to auto. Nope, oh, wrong button. Turn on our taxi light, runway turn off lights if required. Both engines are now stable. APU gens off. APU bleed off and APU off. Okay. Stepping back towards the cockpit, auto brake to RTO, rejected takeoff. Set our flaps down to flaps 10, if I can get the camera right so you guys can see that. So there's flaps five, and you can see the indicator up here on the ECAM that may be hard for some of you to see on your displays, but it is there as well. So like we zoom in, there's flaps five, and we're looking for 10. And I think there's nothing cooler than seeing the 747 with its flaps down. And the spoilers are up because we remember we moved the spoiler handle back. I love the slats. The slats always look cool. God, that's a big plane. Anyway, even the simulator, huge plane. All right, and let's go ahead and put that back. 
All right, so brakes are set, flaps are set, APU is off, APU bleeds are off, transponder is set, anti-ice is set, taxi light is on, flight directors are set, initial altitude set, initial speed is set, and uh, runway heading also locked in. So at this point, we are ready to taxi over to the runway. So to taxi over to the runway, we're also going to want to make sure that our nav display is set on map. At least that's my preference. And let's zoom in. I like to keep it relatively close until after takeoff. Um, how you guys choose to do that is totally your call. Um, you also have your weather radar and everything like that up here, although I don't know how much of it is actually functioning yet in the aircraft. That's why it's not in the guide yet. I need to test some of it because I don't think all of it is actually working. Um, I like to re-verify my altimeter pressure, so I hit B. We're going to monitor our ground speed from either here or here. It's totally your call which one you use, um, but that is going to be your taxi speed. Taxi speed, we're going to be looking anywhere from 20 to 25 knots during straight uh, lines without any obstruction, not to turn exceeding 10 knots. Um, when you're approaching a turn, I recommend reducing to about 7 to 8 knots, making your turn, um, as you will uh, be required to increase engine power in order to bring that nose around, and you don't want to exceed 10 knots, as you can risk rolling the aircraft and doing a wing strike. So, with that in mind, let's continue to taxi. So from here, parking brake disabled, and let's start adding some power and getting her rolling. While we're on taxi, I'll talk to you guys about a couple keys I do recommend you guys binding for the 747. Um, first off, you're going to want to make sure that you have your autopilot disconnect in, uh, mapped to somewhere. That's typically this switch right here. Now, I've heard that's only used in emergencies, but unfortunately I couldn't find another key binding within the aircraft uh, that would allow me to do it any other ways. So that's what I have mapped for now. Um, next is your toga. Take off, go around. There are two little flaps. You can almost see them. There are pictures of them in the guide that are in front of the throttles that actually initiate toga, um, which is what sets the engine power to get rolling. Um, and then finally, the auto throttle arm switch. I do recommend having that mapped as it is something that you're going to want to be able to disengage um, on approach. Um, without having to grab your mouse and reach for the actual control. So I will recommend having those mapped, obviously, as well as something to control your flaps, something to control your landing gear. Those are the biggest ones. Anything else, if you happen to forget, it's not going to be critical for simulation purposes. But uh, any of those ones that I mentioned may give you a hard time. Now, when turning this thing, I will tell you right now that you have to almost use differential braking. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. I think that is a flaw of the simulator. As you guys know, many of the aircrafts, the nose wheel steering is far, far too light um, and just not very accurate at all. And I think this is another one of those situations. Um, you really have to tap your left and right brakes in order to get this thing to get its nose around the corner. Um, but uh, once you do, taxi's just fine. Again, there's our ground speed there. You can see we're taxiing at about 19 knots here. Now, there is a restriction up here as far as aircraft size, so we're going to come up right here and uh, take the taxiway. This London Gatwick uh, airport scenery is absolutely fantastic. A link to this will be down in the description below. I highly recommend it. It's a gorgeous scenery. Uh, you can find it on FlightSim.2 called uh, Gatwick Ultra. Um, it can be a little bit of an FPS hit, but, I mean, nothing that I would say was crazy, but... Obviously, when it comes to FPS, that's going to be based on system performance and, and whether or not your system is able to handle further impact. So, leave that up to you guys, but it is an amazing scenery. They did a fantastic job with this aircraft. Come on, Mama, come around. Come around, come around, come around, come around. You big monster. Love this airplane. Oops. Thing's a beast, man. Look at this thing. Hello, beastie. Well, that was weird. 
Ah, I got a nice crosswind today. That'll be fantastic. That's Bravo. We're gonna come all the way back and take the airport or the take the runway at Alpha. And Alpha two six left. Good. We'll be fine from here. We don't have to go all the way to the back. <clears throat> all right. Before we take the runway. Let's uh, prep her for takeoff here. All right. So as we start taking the runway, we're going to go strobe lights on, landing lights on. Tap those brakes so she starts rolling. Come on, turn, honey. We want L nav and V nav armed. Yeah, turning it can be a real pain in the rear. And again, it just... I, I know it's a gigantic aircraft. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to dispute that. I just... I think it has to do just with that... That nose wheel insensitivity that we have with the default aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. None of the aircraft by default. Their, their nose wheel steering is just terrible. I, I don't understand why that's not something that hasn't been fixed. Like, you just, you can't turn these aircraft. I don't know why uh, all of the aircraft, you know, have to turn like it's a train. Okay. So, let's talk about where we're at here. So, we are ready for takeoff here. We're going to be looking for 50% RPMs on the engine. Once we get to about 50%, we'll release the brakes. We'll engage toga, at which point the auto throttle will take over. Look for a V2 speed of 182 knots, our target speed, I should say. At V1, we'll uh, get the call out, which is very nice. I do like the audio in this. We'll get a V1 call out. Rotate. We will slowly begin rotating the nose up to 15 degrees nose high. Verify positive rate and altitude. Gear will come up. And then we'll be monitoring for our um, thrust reduction callouts and altitudes. Remember, 1,500 feet, we should see the engines roll back a little bit um, as it goes to its climb performance. And then at 3,000 feet, flight directors should instruct us to pitch nose down for acceleration. We'll maintain control of the aircraft uh, probably till about 3,500 feet. Now, another thing I want you guys to be aware of is we are in Europe. Um, and so I believe our transition altitude today is 3,000 feet, 6,000 feet. 6,000 feet, I believe, is what it is. Um, so we will be monitoring for that. Um, don't be waiting for your 18,000 feet. At 6,000 feet, we'll be tapping the standard pressure here on the barometer to switch us back into standard. It should say STD, which is 29092 for our altimeter. We'll be maintaining 4,000 feet until we get to Novma, um, which is our altitude restriction. Once we reach Novma, we'll then go be clear and free to navigate all the way up to 38,000 feet, which is our cruise altitude. And uh, everything should be good. We'll be watching for the um, flap callouts over here on the speed tape. We will see flaps 10. At flaps 10, we still need to be at flaps 10. We will see flap or uh, flaps 5. And when we see flaps 5, we need to reduce flaps 5, flaps 1, etc. So we need to make sure that we do not bring the flaps up until we see uh, the indicators on the speed tape. I know that was a lot of information. So at this point, guys, let me just uh, get us through it. And off we go. So holding the brakes. Looking for approximately 50% on that engine power. Everything stable, releasing the brakes, engaging toga. You can see thrust reference popping up here on the primary flight display. Pitching slightly nose down till we get to about 80 knots. Airspeed alive. Eighty knots. Releasing the uh, downward pressure. Come on. 
V1, hand off the throttle. Rotate, nose coming up. Positive rate indicating landing gear up. Flaps 10 now on the speed tape. Continuing nose up. Managed speed has now taken over. You can see the speed target has changed. There's our 1,000 feet minimums that we talked about earlier. And at this point, we're just following the nav display. There's the engines rolling back. There's a thrust reduction altitude following the flight directors down. Remember, I told you it would be pitching nose down so it can accelerate. Trying to stay with the flight directors. At this point, you could totally engage Command 1 on the autopilot if you want to engage the autopilot. But this is kind of the fun part to fly, to be honest. There's our thrust reduction altitude of 3,000 feet. So look, notice we're pitching way nose down now. Aircraft starts accelerating like crazy. Approaching flaps 5. There's flaps 5. Flaps coming up. Looking for flaps 1 here in just a second. Flaps 1. Flaps 1. And pitching nose down again. It's going to be due to altitude restriction. And flaps secured. At this point, we'll go ahead and engage Command 1. Autopilot now takes control of the aircraft. It's her plane now. And we're sitting tight until we reach Novma. And I do believe I have a typo, by the way, in the guide that I will be fixing, guys. In the uh, guide, I have transition altitude at 3,000. That is a typo, as the 6 key is right above the 3 on the numpad. Sorry, I did not catch that. That was my fault. I tried to reread each page, but by the time I was done typing this, typing this thing, guys, mercy, I was seeing all kinds of weird stuff. Yep, I have it written as 3,000 feet. So I am changing that as we speak to 6,000. Oh my gosh, I did it twice. I'm guessing the first time was a typo. And let's see what else we got. All right, saving that. Mercy. Let me alert all you guys on the Discord. Be sure to join the Discord, guys. Um, it is uh, The link is down in the description join our discord it's a really great community we have so far i've really enjoyed all the people that have joined uh, and chat with us every day it's a lot of fun all right we're now about four miles from Novma. so what i'm going to start doing is setting our altitude remember i said at this point Novma was our only restriction for this departure which is crazy but from here we can go all the way up And from this point, we'll make sure the spoilers are disarmed. Make sure the uh, auto brake, it should automatically turn to off, but always double check it. And we can turn the taxi light off. Give yourself time to learn this stuff, guys. Give yourself time to complete this stuff. Remember, you don't have a co-pilot. Normally, there's two people flying this aircraft for that reason. So, you know, if you don't catch things right on time, don't beat yourself up for it. All right, we've cleared Novma, so what I'm going to do is just give this uh, altitude selector a tap. Thrust reference comes back in the box, and the engine should return to climb performance, and the aircraft should begin to climb up.
<laughs> I'm telling you, man. That stupid transponder. It got me again. I just saw it. I read right over it again. All right. So we passed 6,000 feet. We want to hit standard there. That switches us up to the 299 or 2 uh, barometric pressure. And now let me show you guys the dumb mistake I made with the transponder again. So I, I don't know if I just have something against the transponder or what. And yes, this is in the guide, literally. I So I can type the guide just fine, but apparently in execution, I just don't like transponders. So before uh, we, take, we uh, took the runway, we needed to change this from transponder to t transmit and receive for the uh, TCAS system, uh, the uh, traffic cautionary avoidance system. So that's the only thing that we missed. Before you take the runway, change the transponder from transponder to Tara. I, I do it, and I do it constantly. Like, I, I don't even have an excuse anymore. Like, it doesn't matter what aircraft it's in. I forget the transponder almost every time. I think I just have, like, some sort of, you know, a, a, an unknown hate for them. All right, so we've passed 10,000 feet at this point. Lights can come off. We did that. Okay, I was making sure it actually did turn on. <laughs> like, I didn't miss that, did I? And that is really it for the 747 as far as the climate from here. We will be leaving the aircraft alone until it gets up to 38,000 feet. So from here, uh, we've got quite a ways to go. Like we can set this thing to the maximum 640 nautical miles and we're not even close. Uh, this again, this flight time is I think just shy of nine hours. Um, so I will catch you guys as we get closer to the top of descent, in which case at that point I will show you how we calculate top of descent, how I came to those conclusions, um, and then uh, we'll start walking through descent approach and landing. So I'll see you guys in just a bit. All right, guys, so we are getting close enough now where it's time to start thinking about our descent. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Um, by the way, here's that low fuel warning I was telling you guys about. Um, that's still perfectly fine. If we click on our fuel page here, uh, there it is. You can see we're still looking very good. All the blue still indicates fuel, green indicates fuel. We're doing all right. But now let's talk about how we're gonna calculate our descent. So this for this, we are gonna need a web browser. And again, all this information as usual included in the guide step-by-step but we're going to use something very simple called top of descent calculator. And all we're going to do is we're going to take our current altitude, 38,000 feet, and our end altitude. Now to find our end altitude, I am going to bring up Navigraph charts, guys. I feel like it's easier to show you than going page by page through the guide. But again, all of these screenshots are in the guide. It's just easier for me to explain it, um, I think, using Navigraph charts directly from the application. So what we're doing here is let's take a look. You can see here's our arrivals for JFK. We're coming in on the parch three. I'm talking quickly because I've got quite a bit to cover really briefly and or uh, with not a ton of time. Remember Tusky? We were talking about Tusky as our waypoint. That's the last end, that was the last waypoint in our route. And then we were flying direct to Plym. Okay. Plym is our transition point onto the star. Okay. Which the first waypoint in the star is going to be trait that we're going to be hit. It's really important to pay attention here. We are required to be at flight level 240. From there, we're going to continue on forward, and then we can be at CCC or Calverton, the VOR. We need to be at 250 knots at 12,000 feet. We're going to use this to our advantage. This is the target waypoint that we're going to use for our descent, because everything after that is about stepping down through the approach, and it's actually really easy to manage from that point. And so I find this to be a neat trick for those of you beginning rather than trying to set all the way down to the beginning. Okay, you can see we're about uh, 160 miles there, CC right there. So that's why we're moving pretty quickly. All right, so our ending altitude, we said, is 12,000 feet. Okay. Our speed, start speed, we're going to look at our indicated 270 knots. So we'll actually call it 271. That's what we were at. Our end speed, remember at 12,000, we're required to be at 250 knots indicated. Wind, you can calculate if you want. That requires a bit more calculation to get your average wind speed. I don't worry about it. This is going to give you a rough estimate of where we need to begin. Okay, so using a three degree glide slope, which is very, very common. Vertical speed, if you choose to use it, we're gonna be using managed speed mode, but vertical speed would be approximately 1,380 feet per second, or per minute per second, holy crap, uh, per minute. And we wanna start descending at about 85 nautical miles away. So 
We know that to get to CCC um, or Calverton, the VOR, at 12,000 feet, we need to descend when Calverton reaches right about here, right about 85 nautical miles. We need to make sure we've started our descent. So we have our descent planned out. We know where we're going there. We know what altitude our target is. Okay, now let's go ahead. But we remember, trait is actually our first target. Okay, at trait, we need to make sure we do not break 24,000 feet. So we're going to throw 24,000 feet in the box. We're not going to activate it yet. We're not going to start the descent. Okay, we have to push the altitude selector in order for it to actually start descending. But we're going to get that set up and in the box so it's ready to go. Where am I doing? There we go. All right, so 24,000 feet ready in the box. Now, we got some FMC configuration we need to talk about as well. So let's go ahead and come nose down. Now this is where this damn thing becomes a pain in the butt, so really be careful, otherwise you're going to fight this. Um, and you can move forward, change the camera angles, whatever, you know, there's always ways around it. But what we're going to do is we're going to go to Initial Reference, and we're going to click on the Approach. This is the only way that i found to actually get to this screen. So we're going to click the Approach, and you can set this up later in time. We're doing it right now because we're learning, we're starting out. Get do Do a lot of the prep work before it comes down to the moment of that way you're ahead of the game and you can learn the aircraft comfortably in a comfortable fashion now we have two different types of landings we have flaps 25 and we have flaps 30 um, I typically go flaps 25 um, you don't typically have to worry about flaps 30 only three knot difference you would do that if you're really heavy um, or landing again on a shorter runway um, but uh, we're we're not particularly heavy honestly when it comes to 747's total payload so we're just gonna select flaps 25 at 149 and throw it into flap speed configuration and that will give us our reference speed now we're going to be landing at 149 minus five knots okay so we're actually going to be landing when it comes time we're going to be landing at 144 knots all right and the last thing we need to do is verify that we have the correct ILS frequency in the nav radio configuration. See ILS 111.5, and this is where we're gonna want that Navigraph charts again. Again, all screenshots are included in the guide. We can go to our approach menu here, and we're gonna select runway 13 left, and there it is, 111.5 for ITLK, and here it is right there, 111.5. Okay, so we know that our ILS frequency is already set. We have our approach speed set, our reference speeds. We have our uh, top of descent calculated. We know when, we're, when we need to descend. And so from this point, what we can do is go to progress. Okay, I like to monitor this page. This shows you the waypoint you're flying to, the one following, and then your end destination. This is your time in Zulu, estimated time of arrival. And what you can do is you can take that time from right here as well. So this is our time, estimated 2148 Zulu time. And this is the current time. It says UTC. UTC and Zulu are actually the same thing. So you, know, you can just you know, bait or uh, do your calculations by those two time frames right there. All right. And then so what we're going to be waiting for is, again, for CC to reach right about 85 nautical miles. And then we will begin our descent into New York. So um, I will catch you guys in just a few when we're closer to descent time. I hope you guys are enjoying this tutorial. And we are back. We are still probably about 100 miles away, um, but we're close enough. And because of the sake, again, of teaching, I want to make sure we also stay ahead of the game. So I'm going to go ahead and start our descent now. And... Uh, that way we can stay ahead of things and make sure everything goes smoothly and you guys can work on that in the future. So all we're going to do is give this uh, altitude selector a left click. And down she goes. And you can see the thrust icon comes up. And she's going to descend a lot faster than 1300 feet per minute. There's the engines going to idle. We're watching that overspeed if we need to. Now we could do vertical speed and take it if it starts to get out of control. But if we need to, what we can do is open up. Yep. So we'll just open up the spoilers a little bit. Help slow her down. She's descending really fast. I'm not sure why she's going like such a rocket. So what I'm going to do is do speed intervention. We're going to left click on this knob here. And let's slow her down. 
I want her to stop trying to hit that target. She's trying to hit that target on purpose. So let's just take her down to about 290 knots and see what we get. That should help. And this is where the VNAV, again, that's available, quote unquote, if you call it VNAV, in the 747, the default aircraft, aren't very reliable. And this is why most commonly you see a lot of uh, guys in the simulator, such as myself, um, we will use uh, uh, vertical speed. It's just, it's a better and easier way to track it. And so let me show you guys how to do that real quick. Let's just go to vertical speed mode, because this is crazy. We are descending like a rocket. 6,000 feet per minute in a 747. That's crazy. We do not need to descend that fast. So let's take it down to say, let's do our 1,500 feet. Let's start there. Okay. And then we can uh, let her go back into manage speed mode. Oh, force a speed induction. Okay. But we can let her speed back up. We can retract the spoilers. And there we go. Much more efficient. So I wanted to show you guys both methods there. I wanted to show you guys how we could do it now. You guys saw what we did. Okay, if you want to use the VNAV, that's totally fine. Um, just, again, make sure you get your speed intervention in there and take control of the speed. We don't want her descending that fast. The other thing we can do is we can use flight level change, um, which would only let the aircraft descend at a particular speed. Okay. So, for example, if we wanted to use flight level change, we'd say you can only descend at uh, 326 knots, and that would put us into a really shallow descent. But, for example, if we want to descend at 300 knots, well, now what happens is the aircraft has to pitch nose up until it slows down. Once it slows down a bit, it will be able to pitch nose down again. It's actually a really fun thing to play with all the different ways of descending, figuring out what's best for you. Um, I think for this sake, we'll stick to uh, vertical speed for now. Just keep it at 1,550. That's fine. And let her descend on down. We're definitely going to make that 24,000 foot altitude. So managing the descent is, is all about, A, what's easiest for you. What do you find to be the most comfortable? Watching your charts, you know, the biggest thing, the only the only thing that we had to pay attention to here, and that's why I let her descend at 6,000 feet per minute. That was crazy. It's a good thing we weren't carrying passengers on board. They would have freaked. Um, but uh, um, the only thing you have to watch for is your altitude restriction. So as long as we didn't break 24,000 feet by the time we reached rate, we were okay based on our charts. But that's not always the case. You know, and the next one down is all the way down to 12,000 again at, at uh, Calverton. But sometimes you may see restricted 24,000, and then on parts you would see between 18 and 16,000. And then at, you know, Culverton we might have seen, you know, between 12 and 15,000, you know. So you, you want to also always make sure you're paying attention to your charts. And, and, you know, if you don't have Navigraph or something like that, just make sure you're using, you know, Google. Just, you know, if you're looking for a particular approach plate, just Google that approach plate. Um, you know, you can find everything that you can find on Navigraph, you can find on Google. It's just a bit more of a PIA, you know, but it is there. Okay. But uh, anyway, all right. So next hop is at Trait. You guys can see we're already at the 24,000 feet mark. So what's going to happen is once we pass Trait, we will then reduce down to 12,000. Now we should be able to at this point. Because we're now back in altitude hold. You can see that by the ALT here. That means that we have come out of the descent and the aircraft is leveling out. Once you see the out there, you should be able to adjust this down to the 12,000 feet with no issue. But I'm going to watch it for a second and make sure that's actually true. I've had it sometimes trigger the descent. So you want to be careful. Let's go back into VNAV for a minute. There we go. That's what we want. And now we can take her down to 12,000. All right. Perfect. 
Now remember at 18,000 feet we need to make sure we um, or below 18,000 feet we need to make sure that we set our barometric pressure again again whatever your preferred method is whether it be ATC just tapping the B key on the keyboard um, however you want to do so just make sure you do that and you will need to tap the standard button again to change this away from standard to actually see what you're what you're entering as your uh, barometric pressure that is that is important all right but other than that guys we are actually looking pretty darn good so I will catch you guys in a few all right, so we are coming up on trait. We're one mile away. So let's go ahead and give that a left click again. VNAV speed now calculated. You can see that there. Thrust mode engaged. The aircraft will start to descend once it slows down a minute. This arc here, remember, gives you an estimated time on when you should reach your altitude, both in climb and descent. That's what this arc is all about. So as the aircraft changes pitch, as the aircraft changes speed, this arch will move forward or backward up the flight path. And we're only 11 miles away from Parch. And looks like we're 44 miles away from Calverton. So we're, we're moving right along, guys. We're moving quickly. So from here at 18,000, we will set our altimeter and then uh, continue our descent. All right, so we are now getting ready to pass through 18,000 feet. I'm gonna hit this standard button again. You can see now we're at 299 or one is what it has us back to what it was previously. I'm gonna tap that B key. Now it's showing us 299 or six. Now what I will do with the barometric pressure, I'll try to remember to remind you guys later, I do have it in the guide, is I'll do this again at about 10,000 feet and then typically again at about 3,000 just to make sure nothing's changed. All right, guys, so once again, using the VNAV, uh, we have reached our altitude ahead of uh, Calverton. So, I mean, we really could have stretched that out. And so the VNAV is easier. I'm like, let's call it what it is. What I would recommend if you're going to use the VNAV because the aircraft descends so quickly, which, again, I'm pretty positive is pretty inaccurate. That part is not that just some of these descent rates are extreme for an aircraft this heavy, in, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm mistaken, but I don't think I am on that one. Uh, 5,000 feet, 4,000 feet per minute. That seems like what you would do to expedite a descent. But um, anyway, um, if you're going to use VNAV, use one step at a time, just like we're doing here. Set your target, then move yourself down. Then set your target, move yourself down. Um, we're still in VNAV path. Um, oh, and actually, we should be good. Never mind. So now let's go ahead and... Oh, no, never mind. I was right. I was right. Come on. It's interesting that it's uh, not going back into altitude hold. So we just type hold. There we go. So now that we're in altitude hold, you guys can see how we did that. Just tap the hold button if it's ever doing that. VNAV path, that means as soon as you change your altitude, it's going to descend. Um, but we can set us down to 9,000 feet. It's going to be our next one at Rober. That is, a, again, that's an exact restriction. So we, we can't deviate if we want to follow our charts. And here we are here, and here's Rober. 9,000 feet. Okay. But uh, we are looking very, very good. We're on track. And uh, I will catch you guys as we get closer to Rober. We drop below 10,000 feet. We're going to kick some lights on. And actually, honestly, we can do that right now because we're right at the cloud level. So it's not a terrible idea to have them on as we start descending through the canopy. So let's get landing lights turned on. We're going to go ahead and use the runway turnoff lights as well. Because it doesn't look like with an overcast like that, I'm guessing we're in for a surprise in New York. We'll see what the we'll see what the weather is like. By the way, for the sake of the guide, um, if the wind direction is incorrect, I will come out of live weather mode, and uh, we will configure it to make sure it matches up with the guide for a proper landing. Okay, because I don't want to go mixing things up uh, in relationship to the guide. So to defeat the purpose of this video. <clears throat> All right, guys. So I'll catch you when we get to Rover. It just dawned on me I missed a very important step. Luckily, before we got there, we need to slow this aircraft down. So we're going to speed intervention mode, and we are going to get us down to 250 knots, ideally within the next three miles. Remember, we had that speed restriction at Calverton. So I'm also going to pull the speed brake back, help her dump some of the speed off. 
But uh, so far, we still got two miles until we intercept the waypoint. It looks like we're going to catch it. So we got lucky. But make sure you guys watch for that. I got so busy showing about the uh, um, altitude, I didn't think about our speed. So, all right. But there we go. Oh, I don't want them armed yet. There we go. All right. Now I'll catch you guys at Rover. <laughs> One last thing, guys. Um, I did need to tap the altitude selector in order to get us to descend. I forgot to mention that before we kicked off. I just want to make sure you guys don't forget those steps. All right. As usual, like I said, when you're learning, stay ahead of the game, which is why we're going to do some of this a bit earlier than probably what you need to, but until we get comfortable. Let's take a look at our approach plate for a minute. Some things that we're going to be wanting to pay attention to. Touchdown zone elevation. This is the actual elevation above sea level of the touchdown zone itself where the wheels will hit the ground. So 13 feet. We're doing a Cat 1 ILS, meaning that we have visibility of the runway upon approach. Okay. Um, clear weather, basically, um, this is probably more like a Cat 2, I imagine, but we're fine there. In this case, we'll be fine at 200 feet, though, I believe. Um, so we're going to be doing a cat one to keep things easy. This is the decision height, or also known as your minimums. You have your barometric pressure, which is always going to be altitude plus sea level. So that's where, if you know, it's 213 feet here. So 200 plus 13, 213. Okay, we're going to just use the radar uh, altimeter to determine our minimums, which is going to be 200 feet above ground level. We have our final approach course. This is the actual port final approach heading for the runway of 134 degrees. We have Telex here. This is the initial fix for the ILS. This is when we should have the glide slope and uh, be at proper altitude and lock everything up. Okay, at this point we should be engaging approach mode and the aircraft should be able to take over. Now, as you get more experience, get more comfortable, you'll find that you can engage approach mode a bit sooner. But you can't do too much sooner with this particular approach because of the angle at which that it comes around, okay? Um, really, Telex is the first point that you're actually pointed at the runway, so it's really the most convenient point. Okay, here you have your heading, you have your distance, 8.2 nautical miles, this is from touchdown, and you have your altitude steps, 2100 feet by Telex, 1500 feet by Caxoon, okay, 680, etc., coming down to the touchdown zone elevation, all right? So now let's walk into setting some of this up. So we're going to want to set up our minimums now. We're going to change from Barrow back to Radio for Radar, and we're going to reduce that back down to 200 feet. That way we get our minimums call out when we cross that. What we're going to be doing is at about 400 feet after we've engaged the approach mode, we're going to disengage the autopilot, disengage auto throttle, and take control of the aircraft. Okay. Um, and then at 50 feet or below, we will be looking to flare the aircraft and bring her in. So I just want to give you guys a heads up um, of sort of what to expect from here. We'll be slowing us down here to about 210 knots. Actually, we can do that now. We're going to take us down to 6,000 feet. And bring us down to 210 knots. Oh, forgot to hit it. There we go. So first it's going to slow down, then it should start to descend. Descent has begun. Yeah, that's going to be a cool breakthrough. And so now that we've reached approximately 210 knots, you can see our rate of descent is increasing. All right. So I'm going to get us down to... Uh, that's 6,000 feet, hopefully by right about JFK. And then we, we will talk about all this in a minute. Um, and then I'm going to set us down to 3,000 at Covir. So um, I'll catch you guys right about when we get to Covir. 
So I got to thinking that you guys are probably pretty okay with how I'm managing the altitude at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and take us down to that 3,000 now. That way we just get to where we need to be. And then from 3,000 we'll be looking at 2,100 by Telex. But at this point we're going to skate right past the airport, come around, go over to Kovir, and then we will be uh, on our way onto the approach. So, almost done, guys. See you guys in just a few minutes here. All right, so we're coming up on 3,000 feet. We are about 15 miles, 14 miles from COVID. Or COVID, jeez. <laughs> Enjoy that one, guys. COVID. <laughs> um, let's talk about a few things that we have up on the display at the moment. So, first, you can see that the system has acquired the ILS frequency. The reason why we didn't talk about that sooner is because we're on the wrong side of it. Okay, so we don't, we, I mean, it's cool that it's picking it up, and you can normally pick it up about 20, 25 nautical miles away, um, depending on, you know, line of sight and all that good jazz. <clears throat> but uh, you don't want to, you know, try to use it until you've already passed to the point where you can actually turn around and capture it. Okay, otherwise, you could find yourself lining, or lining up from the wrong direction. Um, let's see here. So we have our localizer indicator. This is the diamond. When it's in the center, means we're right down the center line of the runway. And there's a vertical diamond that we'll see here in a little bit, meaning that we're on the glide slope. If that diamond is up here, we're below the glide slope. If it's over he down here, which is more critical, we are above it. So the cool thing about when we are below the glide slope is that means all we have to do is fly level, and eventually it's going to come down and we'll capture it. If, it's, if we're way above it, we need to descend very, very quickly, or we might need to inst instigate or inst initiate, mercy, a go around, okay? Um, but uh, so far, everything's actually looking really good, guys. We are, we are really uh, looking nice in a good position here. Now, the transition point from Kovir over to um, <clears throat> Telex doesn't take very long at all. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to start reducing down to 200 knots and I'm going to go ahead and a little early again for the sake of tutorial, we're going to go flaps one. Okay, just to sort of stay ahead of the game. That's that's all this is about for today and I highly recommend you guys do this again. Uh, that's why I'm showing it like this. Keep it comfortable guys. Keep it comfortable until you're ready to, to start doing things faster and more like clockwork and, and at the proper time. Stay ahead of it while you're learning. That way you keep the stress level down. These simulators, especially you know when you're learning a new aircraft and you're dealing with some of the issues that we deal with with Microsoft Flight Simulator and then just the, the frustration of, of trying to nail everything all at once can be quite challenging. You know, that's you gotta remember in the real aircraft, there's two of them. Okay, you have a pilot and a co-pilot doing everything that you're trying to do by yourself. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead now and set our final course heading for the runway, which is going to be 134 degrees. Again, staying ahead of the game while we learn. Can't stress it enough. It makes a huge difference. You know, this is how I got the guide out. This is how I practice my aircraft when I'm learning. Stay ahead of it, and then once you get comfortable with it, you know, you guys watch my latest videos with the A320. You know, everything's last minute kind of thing. That's interesting. Right side wings are empty before the left. Hmm. At least according to that. <clears throat> we'll leave everything as is for the moment. All right. It ain't bad at all. All right, guys. I'll see you as we reach the approach. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to set us down to 2,100 feet, which is our um, ILS initial fix. Oh, there it goes. Give it a tap. Idle. VNAV speed. And uh, we will make sure that we are on point. So I'm going to catch you guys as we're getting ready to make the turn onto the initial ILS fix. So I'll catch you guys in just a few minutes. All right. Catching up on some last minute maintenance here. Um, let's go ahead and set our taxi light to on as well. Kind of forgot about that one there. Missed that guy. And we're going to double check our barometric pressure. Make sure we're still where we're supposed to be. 299 or 6 seems to still be good. I'm doing a last walk through the aircraft here. We can now set our auto brakes to medium. We're going to go to auto brake 3. Um, if we had a heavy load or a short runway, we might go a little bit uh, more intense, but we shouldn't need it. There is the glide slope diamond coming down. Remember what I said, as long as it's as long as we're below it, uh, we're fine. Localizer is going to stay on that left side for a minute. I'm going to start reducing our speed down to 170 knots. And we'll be looking for flaps 10.
And remember, we're lab landing with flaps 25 today. There's, oops, wrong way. There's flaps 5 coming down. That was just my fault. I hit the wrong one. And we'll actually go ahead and go down to 165 knots. And again, this is just to stay ahead of the game while you learn. That's why I'm doing everything so early. I can't stress that enough. And every time I try to do this in these tutorials, there's always someone who comments about it. So that's why I'm saying it so many damn times. I know it's early. I'm doing that on purpose. Ideally, you should be starting these uh, configurations at about 15 miles from your final approach. But you know, the A320, you don't really start dropping flaps and things like that until about 10 miles. So, I right, was going to hold our altitude here. There's flaps 10 coming in. And at this point, we'll go ahead and you can see here, we're about 8 miles away, give or take. Let's drop this back. There's Telex from 5 miles and Telex supposed to be 8 miles, so we're looking about 16. Let's go ahead and hit that approach mode. And at this point, the aircraft's going to look for the glide slope. You can see that white GS and that white LOC. It's searching for the localizer and glide slope to lock it up. So the aircraft is now abandoning the flight route that we have set here in favor of acquiring the center line of the runway and capturing that glide slope. And again, this is typically the spot where ATC would vector you into. Typically, they'll vector you to the initial or close to it rather than flying your route through the entire star. All right, you can see here the solid magenta diamond indicates the glide slope is now acquired. As soon as that glide slope comes down to our current altitude, the aircraft will capture and start to descend. So let's go ahead and get the aircraft stabilized before that point. We're going to go ahead and go landing gear down. We're going to reduce our speed to our reference minus five. One, four, nine and we're going to set our flaps. There's 20, and flaps two five. We're now at reference flaps, reference speed, minus five for the landing, gear is down. That's our runway right there. Oof. Localizer and glide slope are now acquired and locked. Aircraft is tracking it. And this is why typically I actually prefer waiting until that last waypoint. That way when we come around and then you engage the approach mode, um, it um, seems to be much smoother and a much more efficient way of capturing the glide slope. The way I did it just now, I actually don't know that I would recommend doing that again. Um, you can see the aircraft's having to make a lot of corrections, especially if you're a passenger aircraft, that would make it pretty uncomfortable for your, your passengers. Look at a thousand feet above ground, getting close. There's that magenta diamond on the localizer, solid. There's the center, there's that thousand foot call out. All right, so what I like to do at this point is I'm gonna disarm the auto throttle and take manual control of the uh, propulsion or thrust. Now the aircraft still has pitch control. All I'm doing is controlling the speed. So unfortunately guys, the recording um, got extremely scrambled through that entire last segment um, where we joined up with Telex and rode the glide slope in. Um, so unfortunately we missed all that. Uh, it just got, it had um, extreme distortion to it. You couldn't really hear me. It almost sounded like I was talking like the Borg. Um, so unfortunately now we're at taxi. Um, so I do apologize for the loss of that. 
I will be doing further videos of the 747, but rather than you guys losing all the information up until that point and me losing the last five hours, I figured we would just come back and check that one again another time. So, unfortunately we missed the landing, the best freaking part, I know, but we can still go through the taxi shutdown, etc. And as I've been chatting, wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. I'm really, I'm really annoyed. Um, so, forgive me guys, I'm, I'm sorry. So from this point, what you would do is we would leave the runway. Once you have totally cleared the runway, this threshold here is what we were talking about, that red line. Once the aircraft is completely clear of it, then we'll clean up the aircraft. So let's get inside here. This is, I'm super frustrated, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that that happened. It was like the best part, right? Um, anyway, so we need to clean up the aircraft. We are going to go flaps cleaned up. Okay, verify the auto brake is off. Spoilers are disarmed. Transponder needs to come back down to transponder. Okay, come up top. Landing lights secured. Runway turn off lights if necessary. We just need the taxi light today. Strobe light off. And I recommend starting the APU at this point as you're going to need it when you park if there isn't a cart available. Um, it's still a good habit to get into uh, having the APU ready to roll. And you can always shut the APU off when we get there. Um, but other than that, let's do uh, make sure I'm not scrambling myself here. Speed reference off. Approach mode off. Crash bar for the autopilot reset. And other than that, folks, I think we are good to go. Now, we should be able to hit a clear or cancel up on that ECAM. Unfortunately, it does not function, um, which really bums me out because it should be this button right here that clears the alert down here, but it doesn't. So other than that, let's go ahead and resume our taxi. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, I'm so upset about that. Five hours, five hour flight to have it uh, to have it fall apart at the very end. Like what the crap, man! All right, well, let's bring her around again using that those foot brakes to turn her. Come on. We will do another flight with the 747 uh, this week. We'll do it. We'll pick a shorter flight. That way, you guys can uh, see the landing from start to finish. We've been given permission to cross. In case you guys didn't know, I don't know if you guys heard that. <laughs> ah, I am so annoyed right now, you guys. I'm so pissed. <laughs> the landing, like the landing. How do you? I. <sighs> And I don't know if that was an issue with the simulator or if it was NVIDIA shadow play. I'm so bummed out. I hate it when crap like that happens. It really, really ruins everything. But what are you going to do? It was cool landing too. Though I think I might have bounced. <laughs> but other than that, I think it felt all right. I will say that uh, this is one of those aircraft that I think I'd prefer to try flying in VR just because you're up so much higher than some of the other aircraft. I mean, well, any other aircraft in the simulator that I can think of anyway. Um, I think I saw that cargo is back over here, although with this simulator it could be anywhere. So honestly, I'll probably just take it somewhere and park it so you guys can see the shutdown. I'm trying not to be bitter. I'm, I'm trying to stay in a good mood, but oh man, I'm, I'm so, I'm so mad. I always check my recordings after, after each segment to make sure everything went well. Did I talk clearly? You know, did everything go all right? And, uh, you know, I just check it briefly, you know, just for those weird audio issues. You know, one of us might have a habit of starting a video with his mic muted. Um, so now I've gotten the habit of like every single time, you know, I do a segment, I check it, especially if I stepped away for a minute or anything like that. Come on, girl. This is crazy. Turn. The amount of thrust I am having to use to get this nose around is crazy. All right. I think it looks like a cargo load. I honestly don't know. This airport is so freaking huge. 
Ah, look, DC6. Hopefully you guys still got some good value out of this video. I hope you guys can hear it. Like, I'm really bummed. I am so bummed right now. The video was going good. I, I, I thought we were on point. Everything was was working nicely. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, big mama. And honestly, that one, I don't see how it could be the simulator. So, it is what it is. Hopefully you guys still like it. Alright, I'm just going to park it at this point because I have no idea at this point now. I got myself all discombobulated now, so we're going to pick a spot and call it parking. I really at least just want you, I at least want you guys to get the shutdown procedure. <sighs> I'm going to park it right here. This plane, I'd be tying it into a knot right now. Right about the time that the engines get behind it. Come on, plane. Turn, man. Why do I feel like we hit something? No, we didn't hit anything. Why can't we move? Okay, well, that's another issue. Um, I don't know what's going on now, but I can't move the aircraft. Oh, it, what the crap? <laughs> you guys, I'm so done. <laughs> oh, I've had so many good flights, and the one that I actually record comes to crap, man. Uh, all right, we're, we're stopping her here. So, there's parking brake on. Let's walk through this shutdown procedure so I can do this without driving myself crazy. So, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure the APU gen is on and active. Remember, we started APU. You can see it's available. So, APU 1, APU 2. Let's step on down here, and we're going to do fuel cutoffs. Get those engines shut down. Oh, and there's Microsoft. Knock it off. Coming up top. Oh, oh wait, we already turned those off. Never mind, I actually did that right. Take our taxi lights turned off. Nav lights off. Beacon light off. Wing light, logo light can come off. APU bleeds for the engines can come off now. Well, um, or bleeds, I should say. Not necessarily APU bleeds. The APU bleed was not on. But bleed switches off. Um, and then we can come around and... Turn our fuel pumps off. Flight directors off. VORs off. Autopilot panel is clear. Transponder to standby. Doing our flow. Flaps are secure, auto brake is secure, landing gears down locked, oh, spoilers are disarmed, parking brake set. Panel clear, boom, coming back up top, working our way down, IRS is off, APU off. Standby power off, and batteries off. And we have a cold and dark 747. Well, folks, I truly hope that you enjoyed 90% of that at least. I hope that you learned a thing or two about flying the 747. Hopefully on our next flight, things go a bit better with the landing. I am, you guys obviously know how I feel about it, so I will, I will stop saying it. Um, and as always, guys, be sure to like and subscribe. I truly appreciate all the support. If you're interested in my 747 tutorial guide, please check me out on Patreon, where you will also get access to all of my other guides as well. Stay safe, stay healthy, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.